UNL. And I'm Rachel Larson, the other assistant director at Career Services at the College of Business Administration. Wow. <laughs> Aren't we all love to be introduced by music, so. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about strategic planning your career. We know in business, come, every company has a strategic plan. Probably every five years, go back and review it. But in, a lot of times we don't plan our own career. We don't plan where do we want to go. We just think it'll happen. We'll take it there. And you really want to be much more strategic with your own life and with your own career and really take those business mindsets too. So I'm going to have to sit and stand behind the podium. So I'm a walker, so I'm going to apologize. <laughs> trying to deal with the two mic situation here. So, I want you to think back to high school, college, and that sort of thing, early in your career, where a lot of people are really asking you, hey, what are you gonna do with your life? What are you gonna do for your career, right? So think back to that. You're going through high school graduation, you're shaking hands, and every single person is, congratulations! What are you gonna do with your life? So now, as you get further in your career, though, people don't ask that question as much, right? But there are still those tough decisions that you're going to be making. We want to encourage you to make sure that you're being leaders in your own career. Because early in a career, it's really easy to do that. You have a lot of people who are invested in you, they're excited about you, and for some reason, as we get more experienced, I'm not going to say older, more experienced, that for some reason drops off. And we need to make sure that we're an advocate in our own career because there are tough decisions throughout your entire career that you're going to be making. Now, business leaders, they do that all the time. They're strategic planning with their company. So they're really thinking about where is our company going? What's the vision? What do we do? So to give you a good example, Southwest Airlines, they know that their whole mission, their whole vision is customer and employee service. And every single tough decision that they make revolves around that mission and that vision. Well, that's what we need to be doing in our own career as well. We need to make sure, just like business leaders, that we are planning for our career. Because as John Wooden said, the failure to prepare is preparing to fail. So but those business leaders know that. They're doing that on a regular basis. And that's why we need to make sure that in our career we're doing that as well. And that's something that companies use that strategic plan to make those tough decisions. They, they have it, they can refer back to it, and companies who don't share that mission, that vision with their leaders and with their staff, no one is gonna be able to buy into it. No one knows what the company's mission is. So this is something you should be sharing with others too. It's not even though it's your own personal statement. It should be shared. It, you should have other people buying in to that same mission and vision because you're not an island. Uh, you have relationships. Your decisions can impact others. So it's important to make sure that you're getting that buy-in and being prepared and being planful is incredibly important, not just in business, but also in your life. And so strategic plans typically start with a mission and a vision. And ultimately, we know in business there's limited resources. We know in life there's limited resources. You only have so much time, energy, and effort, and not enough of it. And so how do you determine where you want to spend that? How are you making those decisions to know where to spend that time, energy, and effort? That's, again, where that strategic plan can come into place with your own career or with your own life. Where do you want to spend that time and energy? So the mission is pretty straightforward. That's who am I? Who am I right now? Who do I want to be is more of that vision, that long-term goal. So Martin Luther King Jr. did a fantastic job with mission and vision. Everyone knows his mission? End inequality. That was basically the straightforward mission of what he wanted to do. Now his vision, that I have a dream speech, this is one of the most powerful vision statements that I think has ever been out there. It changed a nation with that vision statement. So he was able in that speech to put imagery in there so people from across the nation could connect and it resonated internally with, with everyone who was out there. They could always sit here and see the snow-capped Rocky Mountains. You know, that he was using language that you could see, you know, the sweltering injustices. And they could notice it was with the South where the heat is there. So he was really good about getting that mission and getting people to buy into it. 
That's the other thing. Buy-in. Not just from others, but from yourself. You can set a strategic plan and say, this is good, but if, there's, if you're not confident about it, you're probably not going to buy into it. So you really want to ask yourself the question, what do I do? Oops. Who do I do it for? Why do I do it? Where do I want to be? Who do I want to impact? And then when those tough decisions come, you start evaluating those same questions and determining, all right, I can say no to this. It's OK to say no to this because it doesn't, isn't where I want to spend my time, energy, and effort. And I can be confident saying no in that regard. Now, we have a little activity here. So with you, I know you have a notepad and a pen, so if you want to take that out. We know that many of you have years left in your career. So when you retire and your company presents you with this service and retirement plaque of thank you so much for your years and years of service in recognition of, what do you want that plaque to say about you? <laughs> so I want you to take a few minutes really to reflect on what you, you want your retirement plaque to say about you, and then kind of write it down. Well, so I'll give you a few minutes to do that. I love the energy in the room. This is fantastic. All right, now is there anyone? Now we saw some great conversation. I think we even saw this table was toasting. Uh, so uh, anyone willing to perhaps share? What We're going to probably pick on our wonderful Dean here first. Yeah. <laughs> if you would please share your wonderful retirement plaque. So hopefully it's not for many years, so at least we'll know what to put on it, right? This is what I get for actually cooperating. <laughs> Okay, in recognition of the energy and spirit you brought to this organization that enabled great things to happen, things we never would have thought possible, like a new CBA building. And we're taking donations on the way out. Anyone else willing to share? Excellent, thank you. We can get you to read that into the mic, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. In recognition of Angelique Eisenberg, who has inspired people to express themselves openly and honestly and to be their best selves. She is the happiest, most positive person I know and is there for anyone who needs her help. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Hi, first of all, I'm never retiring, so but, uh, it would say something like, uh, from R.C. Young, for living at the highest level of leadership, development, courage, and love. Excellent. Great. This, great. This side of the room is doing really well. We're going to have to get somebody over there. <laughs> all right, I don't know if I need a mic. Can everybody hear me? Yes. <laughs> Here, there. Happy <laughs> um, my name is Maggie Thorne, and I currently work at the Nebraska Athletic Department, but I'm also a mother of three and a wife of a football coach. So I wrote it holistically as my life. Um, in recognition of her commitment, loyalty, and love to serve, her empathy and compassion for others, set an example in her legacy and how she treated all equally. A passion for her family, commitment, and work will be remembered and inspire others. Excellent. <laughs> Because you all have wonderful 
recognition plaques and the ways that you want to be remembered. If I was doing this exercise, I think it would take a lot more thought and a lot more time than it would be in just the five minutes that we gave you. Because it is really hard oftentimes to think about what we want our legacy to be. And then it's even harder perhaps to figure out how to get there. And that's the strategy part, because it's one thing with Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech to be able to say, I have this dream, but what happens next? So the big thing with this strategic plan is that you need to figure out how you're actually going to get there. And that's where it's trying to figure out first where you are now. So where are you in your current professional development, in your current career? To be able to say, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? So that internal sort of thing. So where do you see yourself and where those strengths and those weaknesses are? So that way you can really do an environmental scan of yourself in order to figure out how you're going to get there in the future. But then, of course, externally, the things that are outside of our control, we have with the opportunities and threats. So we've provided you a handout um, which actually has a SWOT analysis for you. We're not going to do anything with it today, but we do want you to take this home because this is something that you're going to want to do to figure out where am I, how can I reach my goals, but I've got to figure out where I am currently at this particular moment. But it's also important to then figure out how that works in with your goals. And those goals can definitely be those long-term goals, that strategic plan, but you also need to have those sub-goals to kind of figure out how am I going to get there. I actually um, had a coworker one time who was writing a dissertation, and she said, you know what, I had to think of it in small incremental goals because if I thought about completing the whole thing, it was overwhelming to me. So same thing happens with your career. If you're looking at that retirement plaque and saying, oh my goodness, how am I going to get there? It's oftentimes helpful to think in those baby steps. So what are the first initial short-term, medium, and then long-term goals that are going to get you to that retirement plaque vision in the first place? And I will say the difference between a dream and a goal is the written word. Mm -hmm. So writing things down makes a huge impact. It holds yourself more accountable. So you can think in your mind, but you haven't told anyone. So if you don't do it, the only person you let down is yourself. And you know, so it's OK. There's no failure out there. So writing things down sometimes puts a little bit more accountability and a little bit more pressure. That's a good thing. That keeps us striving and motivating to keep moving forward. So I do really encourage you to not just think about it, but put it down on paper. And again, a key theme, share it with others. Get other people to buy in. That's very helpful. Yep. And starting to plan with what are the action steps that I'm going to take to get there. And that other side of the sheet has some, uh, a sample career action plan for you to kind of take a look at as well. And hopefully leave here today planning this information out. Because that vision is one thing, but actually acting upon it is potentially completely another thing. So this, though, does not come without risk. You're going to take risks to get there. And that's actually a good thing. It's a positive thing. We have a quote here for you from Mark Zuckerberg. Everyone know the founder of Facebook, perhaps? The biggest risk is not taking any risk. In a world that is changing really quickly, the only strategy that is guaranteed to fail is not taking risks. So we're not telling you, oh yes, let me take a risk by jumping off this cliff and see if I'm going to survive. No. That's not the sort of risk. It's a calculated risk, one that you think is potentially going to work out positively in your favor, but also has the chance to potentially fail, because that's life. You have those tough decisions that we talked about in the beginning. They're tough for a reason, because there's potential for failure to be involved, and that's OK. So this strategic plan has the potential to fail, but it also has the potential to succeed more than your wildest dreams, perhaps more than what you want that retirement plaque to be. And that's the exciting thing about it. So as we uh, know in the career services world, there's a theory that we all love, and it's called planned happenstance. And so it's being planful, knowing that sometimes timing and luck does come into it and taking those risks and knowing when to do that, but also that positive mindset that you have to have. So the action plan, that's the planned part of it. The chance, that's the happen. 
the stance, that's the positive attitude. And so when you combine all of those together, that's really when things happen and you can progress a lot through your career. So we know in strategic planning, you know, they're using this. They use that strategic plan because they know there's going to be things that they just didn't expect to happen. And so, again, that strategic plan helps them determine what do I want to do? How do I want to react to this? That world is constantly changing. We know there are careers that are going to be available next year that don't even exist today. You know, the world is changing that quickly. So, you know, setting up career goal of I want to be this job title sometimes can be a good thing, but sometimes can also be a little bit limiting. So you need to make sure that your plan is a little bit flexible and allows room for those chance encounters. So I wouldn't even be standing here today if I didn't turn down a job in 2007. So this is my plant happenstance story. So I was going through, I was finishing up with my master's program, and so I had a job offer at a great school uh, in Indiana. And I really liked it, I enjoyed it, but I had another on-site interview at a school that I thought, you know, I'd never been there, but from the sound of it, I think I'd like it a little bit better. I wouldn't get that other job offer before I had to let the first company or first school know whether or not I was gonna take that job or not. Good school, I liked it, the staff was great. There was just something saying, do I take that risk? And I decided, you know, even if it doesn't work out at the other school, there's a few other options that I have. So even if it doesn't work out, I'm gonna take that risk. And I'm so glad I did. So I actually turned down the job offer without another job offer in hand. Terrifying, absolutely terrifying, but it actually worked out. And I was offered the job at the University of Tennessee. I actually had a chance to interact with our wonderful Dean Plowman down there. Uh, and you know, I also met my husband when I was down there. So when he was going through, and uh, he was going through a PhD program, and he decided, you know, I need to go do some job searching now. So he was looking for state and federal government, and it was 2011. Government was not really hiring very much at that point in time. <laughs> so. What state was hiring? Um, Nebraska. So, of course, I had ties here. So he had a few other options, but he decided, you know, it'll be easier for you, so I'm gonna take that position. And so then, we were actually on vacation when he decided, okay, I'm gonna accept the job, and so it's like, okay, well, I guess I, after I finish vacation, I'll start looking, but I put out a few feelers to some of my network, and they came up and said, you know, this is where the luck comes in. Say, so, oh yeah, the, the College of Business is opening up these career counseling positions in about a month or two. Well, well, good, that's exactly what I was doing down there. And so I was able to you know, find out a lot of background information from you know, friends and colleagues that I had you know, who were still here, who were kind of able to say, this is the conversations that have been had, this is why they're opening the office, this is some, some of the goals. So I was really able to find some of that background information, be very planful in my application, what I was saying through the interview process and preparing, and then I'm very fortunate to be up here today. So if I would have accepted the job, I would be in Indiana, probably would not have moved back necessarily yet. Uh, so, it, so it's very good. You never know what is going to, what risk is going to turn out amazingly in your favor. Uh, and so, of course, it was very calculated. Turning down a job offer when you don't have one, uh, not everyone's <laughs> gonna be able to do that. But you know, I was so, so thrilled that, that I did. And I have so many other stories about that. But in general, luck is no accident. And risks are good, and sometimes risks don't turn out. But you always learn something. You, know, you always learn something from either a failure or you know what I'm going to do next time or maybe you find out I thought I loved this but I don't. And that's a good thing to find out. You're not necessarily going to find out just sitting there thinking, well, will I like it or not? I'm not going to risk it. You need to sometimes go out of that comfort zone to find your passions, your loves, and what you want to do next. So it may seem counterintuitive that we're telling you plan, but then look. So, they're actually very closely related. Because as Janine's story really illustrates, you're putting yourself planfully into situations so that luck can happen. And that's the key. That's why this is called planned happenstance versus just happenstance. So, you are really making that luck happen for yourself. And we have another example for you, a more recent one actually. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a man named Brian Acton, and he was the 44th employee at Yahoo. Graduated from college in 1996 and joined this up-and-coming technology company. Worked there for 10 years. 
but decided throughout that experience that technology wasn't really moving in the direction that he thought it needed to move. And so he quit his job, went traveling around the world for two years, and then came back and decided to start applying for technology jobs again. He tweeted in 2009, Got denied by Twitter headquarters. That's okay. Would have been a long commute. <laughs> so, turning that rejection into a positive framing sort of experience. Uh, later on that year, he also got turned down by Facebook. It was a great opportunity to connect with some fanta fantastic people looking forward to life's next adventure. So this man is putting himself in a place where he's making connections with these particular companies, but he's also keeping a positive attitude about it. And in 2014, him and his partner sold WhatsApp to Facebook for $19 billion in cash and stock. <laughs> so this is a man who in 2009 was literally on food stamps with his family, and then in 2014, signed his deal with Facebook in the actual conference room where he picked up his food stamp checks. <laughs> so obviously in this situation, he made those connections, he kept that, that positive attitude, he put himself in a place where luck could happen. Now obviously it wasn't lucky that he got a great app that he created. <laughs> he worked at that with his partner, but there are so many great ideas out there that just don't happen because the right people don't know about them. And that's where planned happenstance for this particular individual occurred because he put himself in the situation for the right people to know about it. So, planned happenstance is everywhere. Janine and I happen to work with students on a regular basis where early in their career they're not really seeing this planned happenstance as much. Their stories, for example, could be something like, well, I was at my hairstylist, and I needed a summer job, and she just happened to have a client that needed a nanny, and so then I got a summer job from that, and it turns out they happened to be in the same industry that I was looking for, and got an internship the next summer. So, we have more extended <laughs> planned happenstance stories as well. So what we'd like you to do is share your planned happenstance story with your table. So planned happenstance, as you probably can tell, is one of those hindsight's 2020 sort of theories that it's really easy to see after the fact, but it's harder to see when you're actually involved with that. I mean, my story goes all the way back to when I was a sophomore in high school, and it involves listening and talking to my mother, as much as I hate to admit it, perhaps. <laughs> so. Where there was a scholarship in a camp, for example, um, that only one sophomore from each high school in the state of Nebraska was allowed to go to. And I went to a very small high school, and in this particular situation, uh, nobody in my class applied to go to this camp. And one day, our guidance counselor came up and basically chewed us out in the hallway. And of course, in my high school mind, it probably was wasn't chewing out, but it felt like she was really yelling at us. And so when my mother asked me that day, being the good mother that she is, uh, she said, so how was your day at school? And I was like, well, let me tell you, our guidance counselor just totally chewed us out for not doing this, filling out this uh, camp invitation, whatever it was. And so I explained the whole situation to my mother. And you know what she said? It was not the supportive, oh, that's awful. It was, you will march back into her office tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and you will tell her you will go. Oh, well, this is not how I thought that conversation was going to go. So, of course, I knew I'd hear about it the next day. And so I marched in at 8 a.m. and said, I volunteer. So... Forget about it for a couple months because this thing wasn't happening until the summer. Get to the summer and my mother drives me to this camp and reminder, I know no one there. So I get dropped off and my mother is here with me, have my suitcase with me, and the first person I see is this guy who had his hair down to here and it was braided all around and I went, oh my God, I'm at freak camp. Get me out of here. <laughs> And my mother said, bye, and drove off. So, needless to say, I'm at this camp. I end up loving it. Because in my high school, the cool thing wasn't to speak your mind. It was to conform. And at this particular camp where you're put with people you don't know, 
they teach you how to speak your mind. And I learned from that moment how to be a leader. And that moment, that camp, I got to go back and serve on staff. It got me a scholarship to come to the university and participate in a particular class that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if it hadn't been for my leadership in high school from that organization and then others that I got after that organization. I had a mentor from that particular class who one day, I was one of those people that never changed my major all four years of college, and I said one time, just wishingly, hey, Diane, you have the coolest job ever. I wish I could have that job, just kind of nonchalantly, and she said, you can. And I went, whoa. That was my aha, my enlightened moment. Because in that particular situation, then when I went into advertising and decided, you know what, after college, this really wasn't for me. I then thought back on that moment to be able to say, all right, when was I the happiest? What is my dream? What do I want my retirement plaque to say? And that for me was helping people and in particular helping college students. So I got a chance to then go back, do the same master's degree program that Janine did, and found my calling working with students one on one. But that's professionally not the only thing that happened. 14 years later, I married that braided boy. <laughs> um, so, this summer we will celebrate our 10 year anniversary and we have a beautiful three year old daughter. So, those situations have a chance to completely impact you and have that hindsight 2020 moment. But it all means that you've got to put yourself in those situations and act upon yeah. them. So how do you make it happen? What's the takeaway? Okay, you're getting speakers from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. You don't think you're actually going to leave without homework, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, we gave you the, the takeaway. So, again, that's your homework. You're not getting graded, but it's really going to be helping yourself. That's why we want you to, to do it. So really start planning, clarifying your goals. That's the hardest part is identifying really where do I want to be and why? What's important to me? It's so easy to stay in the comfortable, the familiar, well, this is working for me right now, so I'm happy. I don't have to think about that yet until I'm unhappy. You should still be planning even when you're happy. Even when you're loving something, you should still always be running towards a goal or else you're just running in place. So make sure that you're kind of clarifying your goals and that it's not just this one time, but that you kind of consistently, maybe once a year, go back and look and say, where am I? What did I act on? What did I do well? What maybe could I do better next year? You know, so this is an all, you know, something that you're always striving towards. You're never going to get there. There was a great article, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, about a 70-year-old at the University of Virginia who's one of the big leaders in their student section. He wears this big orange wig. He was able to you know, pledge a fraternity, uh, even though he doesn't live in the fraternity. Uh, his wife said, no, I'm not moving into a fraternity. <laughs> And you know, his, the quote at the great was, you know, the last, he was 70, he said, you know, I'm 70, I think I finally determined my life's purpose. It's like, I know what I want to be when I grow up, was his exact wording. He's 70. He's always looking for that next thing. You can always do that. So you never, never think necessarily that you've arrived, because there's always more that you can do. And it's just identifying where do you want to spend your time, energy, and effort. So removing the blocks. Don't get, Think about positive reframing. Don't say, I can't because. Ask yourself, how can I? Much stronger. I can't because that is just kind of a cop out. You want to, again, identify what those obstacles are, but then say, how can I overcome those obstacles? There's always ways to sometimes get around it and think about it. So that's where the flexibility comes. Again, act, you know, setting that plan of action, but also know, all right, this didn't work, so I have to try something else. You, you really want to make sure you have that flexible plan, taking those calculated risks. And again, this is where it's helpful to have conversations because you can sometimes be paralyzed by what the what ifs. What if it doesn't work out? And sometimes having other people say, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, why not? The, well, why didn't you? You're going to go and, you know, and do that. So again, help, tell people. Share your plan. Share your vision. Get other people to share it too. Because that's gonna, they're going to be able to also help you remove the blocks. So you're, you don't have to do this yourself. And then 
The most important part is taking action. And that's really what we want to leave you with today, is that you want to be planful throughout your entire professional career, throughout your entire personal career. Be planful, take those risks, but the most important thing is action always beats intention. Because it's one thing to be planful, but it's another thing to actually do something about it. And that's where you're going to, re to achieve your retirement plaque moment. So we really want to thank you very much today. Uh, hopefully we get a chance to uh, chat with you a little bit as well because we can't leave this presentation without doing our plug for career services at CBA. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> please hire our students. They are fantastic. Um, and so, and, pay and, them well. And pay them well, exactly. So uh, we really do have great, so if you are looking for part-time internships, full-time opportunities, and just don't know how to connect, we can help you connect. We can help you make those connections, especially to CBA, and if not CBA, UNL, uh, in general, is, is always our, is our message. And I do want to put a plug in, too, on May 20th, the College of Business is hosting its third annual Employer Partners Day. It uh, doesn't have to be anyone who's in a HR position. It really is open to you know, organizations who want to learn more about the College of Business Administration, learn more about recruiting opportunities, connect to the college. Uh, so it, you know, it's a morning and lunch, so you'll get two free meals you can't you know get a breakfast and a lunch so it's great so it's May 20th and uh, <laughs> so you can there's a web on our website uh, you can find the link to our career par uh, employer partners day and of course I have business cards so if you want an invitation personally uh, please come and see us yes. and also if any of you are alumni or have students who are in college we'd love to see them and make sure that they're being planful about their careers as well and starting really early with that so we would love to see any of your students or any of you as well so we look forward to that and with that you get a break now mm -hmm. <laughs>